Turn your Bibles, if you would, and you, you pray for my voice. This is a leftover from um, the bronchitis I had, and it's lingered. I noticed yesterday, without, without being uh, grotesque, uh, that I was still coughing up thick stuff, and... Um, Try to sing in the car a little bit. And notice that my voice don't have the strength back that it had before. So a lot of those songs I sing, uh, I don't have them high notes yet. I don't have them back yet. I'm praying I get them back. So <clears throat> anyway, appreciate all your prayers. Uh, remember, we mentioned this week um, that we will be doing a feeding um, Kister is going to um, arrange that for Thursday, Friday, and I believe Saturday up near Lodwar in Turkana. And um, so be praying for that, be praying for that feeding. We also talked about, um, was talking with Michael yesterday and remembering uh, the, the time we went to Kibera, which is about the third largest slum in the world. And it's in, it's in Nairobi, and there's several slum areas in Nairobi. And, um, boy, I tell you, it is a completely different world in there. It's a lot of tin roof places just, just put up and subdivided and... They, those people have their own, um, it's like their own world inside there. Um, there is every kind of market that you can think of, um, every type of um, anything that you need built, anything you need fixed. Uh, there's a little place there that somebody's doing that. Um, <clears throat> we drove by one old fella and, uh, he was, he had a grill out in front of his place and he was grilling chicken for people to sell. Now, my daughter mentioned something to me yesterday, Alicia, that kind of upset me. Uh, my first trip to Kenya, I found out samosas. And they are absolutely amazing. I love samosas. And from what I found out, its, it's origins come from India. But it's a, um, it's a sort of a dough wrap with a spicy meat, ground meat in it. And it's deep fried. And buddy, it is a little pocket of heaven. And... Um, I remember Michael had left me in the car one time. He went to, I don't know, if, I can't remember what he was doing, but he parked me just in front of a lady in Cabrera that was sitting there hand-making samosas, and she'd drop them in the fryer and bring them out and set them. People walk by and drop a few shillings in her hand and pick one up and walk away. And I'm going, he told me not to eat anything from here, but boy, that looks good. So I opted for a, later that afternoon for a gas station version of a samosa, and it was good. And uh, then um, the last time I had them, there was a guy making them up in Seattle. There's a famous market in the uh, Seattle Bay uh, where this fish market is and all this stuff, and there's somebody up there making samosas. Well, I knew what they were, and man, I just bought them. We were fixing to board a cruise ship. And uh, I bought them to eat, and they were pretty good. But Alicia f informed me that she knows how to make them. And I'm going, how long have you been able to do this? She said, quite a while. I said, why haven't you told your father that you know how to make samosas? And uh, so she said, I'll make you some. Well, apparently she didn't mean today. So anyway. Genesis 18 Let's read a little bit of this story, and then we'll go in various places in scriptures, and we will, uh, we're going to study angels, and the works of angels, the ministry of angels, uh, some things they do, some things they don't do. I, I obviously won't be able to include every scripture in here. Do you believe in guardian angels? 
Who believes in guardian angels? Okay. And I'll show you that. I'll show you that verse. In fact, that's probably the first place I'll go to. And I'll show you that. In Genesis 18, verse 1, the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door. Bowed himself to the ground. Now you could say this is a typical Middle Eastern traditional greeting. That any stranger that comes by, you treat them well. You bow yourself to the ground in a form of submission. But I think it was more than that. I think Abraham realized who at least one of the men was. He recognized who one of them were. And he said in uh, verse 3, and said, My Lord... And now we're getting an understanding of who at least one of the angels is. If you wanted to study this out on your own, write down the phrase, angel of the Lord. And I believe that most Old Testament appearances of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Now, I do not believe that the New Testament occurrences of an angel of the Lord is Jesus because um, he, is, he has a different role post his resurrection uh, in the four Gospels. He's, he is the mediator standing at the right hand of God. And obviously the angel of the Lord cannot, I, I just wouldn't think that the angel of the Lord would appear along at the same time that Jesus is physically on this earth. I just, I can't believe that. But I believe that most of the occurrences of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the very person of Jesus Christ. It is God being able to appear on this earth uh, because later on God is going to be incarnate. He is going to become flesh and actually dwell among us as people. And so he says to him in verse 3, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Remember, it's a hot day, and Abram is sitting sort of, he's, you don't want to sit in the tent during the day like this, it's too hot. You don't want to be outside the tent, it's too hot. So he's sitting in the sort of the shade of the tent, but to receive the outside air, which would be a little bit cooler than what was inside the tent. And um, so he says, let a little water, verse 4, I pray you be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. I was craving on the way over this morning my biscuits and gravy. I wouldn't have stopped at Hardee's or McDonald's for nothing because it's not the same. I make... Gravy from scratch. I fry when, whenever I fry bacon. I do not ever throw bacon grease away. Ever, ever, ever do you throw bacon grease away? You can mix a little flour with that and make a roux. They call it a gravy roux, and uh, store that in the freezer or whatever. And next time you want biscuits and gravy, just drop some of that roux in a pan and add milk to it. And stir that up for a while till it thickens and you've got the best gravy in the world. I hear Todd's going to be making some gravy. Is that true? Homemade gravy for homecoming. Woo! Not that store-bought can stuff. Without telling anybody, one year I made gravy with lard and I didn't tell a living soul and it was good it was really good I mean once a, I'm sure once a year you can afford to have a little lard gravy amen your listen your grandparents I knew a guy from Rich Woods he was one of, he was one of the elder men of the church and I loved him dearly that man was strong as an ox. I mean, when it, he worked on a motor one time and he lifted that motor out of that car himself. Picked that thing up and set it down. I mean, he was strong. He was dying of uh, leukemia. And it took forever 
for the leukemia to take his life because he was just that strong in body. And I went and his name was Ott Vest and I went and visited him. I said, Ott, how you, he's over here. I said, how you like being in the hospital? He said, ah, food ain't no good. It ain't seasoned right. And I found out that he ate everything in lard. I mean, he cooked everything that he ate. He was a bachelor all his life and just cooked all of his own meals and ate everything he had in lard. Didn't have, and had no problems with cholesterol, obesity, none of that. All right, anyway. I'll fetch a morsel of bread, verse 5, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. They said, so do as thou hast said. So Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah. Now this, I want you to pay attention to this. This sort of helps us understand that when angels make an appearance into this world, that God is telling you there is very little difference in their physical form. That they have the bodies of men, and we know that we know that He has made His angels uh, his, as spirits and as ministers of flaming fire. We know that that is the substance that they are built of. But also, for some reason, when they make an appearance in this three-dimensional world that we live in, that their bodies take on a three-dimensional physical mass. Form, In other words, they can be touched, obviously, because their feet were washed by the servants of Abraham. They sat down, they didn't just float into town, and they ate the food that was given to them. Okay? So, they had, as far as we can tell, all of the, as all of the physical aspects of a human body... They had it right down to the ability to take in nourishment, to drink milk, water, whatever it is, to have their feet washed, to sit down with Abraham and to eat a meal with him. And uh, so in verse six, and Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make re ready quickly three fine, uh, three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth and run. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched the calf tender and good. Gave it unto a young man, and he hastes to dress it. And we we're talking about, he's giving him the best. He's not cooking some old cow that he's got. A young calf. He's giving them, what is it, veal? He's making veal cutlets for them. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. They said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. Now listen to this. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the door at, at which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. In other words, the woman's body. Uh, I talked a little bit about this in a Watchman broadcast that I, I labeled it so that some parents, they may not want their children listening to it. But after the manner of women, meaning that she has gone past her time of fertility. God gives a woman some, a, some certain amount of eggs in the womb. And then once they have gone through that, there is no more fertility to be left. Uh, Sarah has gone through what we would call the menopausal stage of her life. And God does this on purpose. He wants everybody to understand just how powerful he is. He can take a body, even though her body was alive, Sarah's still alive, she's 90 years old, and everything operates and functions the way it should with the, with the uh, exception of the parts that would bring about fertility. Um, she still, I guess God created or left behind one egg left. After all these years, just one. And um, that's why he said, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, according to those stages that a woman goes in, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah de uh, denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was... Oh, I missed verse 13. 
Uh, the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, So shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Underline that verse in your Bible. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. God does the impossible. And he does it every day. He does it every day in people's lives. Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And I want you to notice that God did not in any way, because she laughed at the saying of the Lord, God did not at any time withdraw his promise to her. Once he made a promise, he intends to keep it. He will. God will be faithful and just. Somebody say amen. Uh, the men rose up thence and looked toward Sodom and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? He's talking to these angels in private now. And seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For an I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment and that, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. I'm going to stop right here and we'll get into this issue of angels and the, the parts that they have and how they can appear, how, how they can move about and so on. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray your blessings upon your lesson tonight. Open up the, uh, our eyes to your word. Help us, dear God, to see and to believe and to know, Lord, that it's highly possible. It is highly possible that in our lives we have encountered angels unaware of who they were, of what they did. Father, but I believe I have on at least two or three occasions. And Father, if that's the case... I pray, dear God, that you would bless those angels. I thank you for sending them my way. And Father, if they be but mortal men, I pray, dear God, that you would bless them. And show them your light and your love for being kind to a preacher. Being kind to me, Father, at times when I needed that. So, Father, I pray your blessings now upon this lesson. Bless all of those, Father of your holy angels, Lord, that have stepped in, intervened in our life, saved our lives, and helped us along the way, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, I have the verse up on the screen, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. Be not careful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now this one story is, is one of the stories that I can tell you is a partial fulfillment of, he of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. The fact that angels could be among us in our presence, we could be talking to them, we could be conversing with them, they could at times help us and aid us in various things, and then once they do, their ministry to us is temporarily done. And then they will just simply disappear. Um, let me tell you a story. I've told you the story about the man that came to our church barbecue that we helped out. There was a time we were bringing children back from camp and uh, our own personal vehicles. And at the time I had a... Had a uh, a Dodge Grand Caravan, and the one of the the serpentine belt kept coming loose, and we were in some I can't remember what town it was up along 44, but it was near St. Roberts, Missouri, where Fort Leonard Wood is, and I remember I pulled up into a gas station, and as as I pulled down the gas station, the serpentine belt came completely off of the vehicle. Now, I'm not a mechanic, and I don't know how in the world to get that thing back on. And I'm just going, I don't know what to do. Two young men came walking up. And they said, do you guys need help? 
I said, why do you ask? And they just said, well, we just kind of see that, you know, maybe you guys are having some motor problems. I, I said, I think the serpentine belt came off of this thing. And they said, well, well, let's help you. And they went, got out of their vehicle, big, big toolboxes. And they went and they got up under that thing and they worked on that thing and they had that belt on in a matter of minutes. And I said, who are you, you guys? And they said, well, we're here stationed at the base. We're in the, we're in the army. And that's the last I've ever seen or heard of them ever. And I often ask the question, were those two men angels? Highly, po and that's not the only time that I've had a situation like that where somebody just walked up, showed up, offered to help, fixed whatever it was, and then gone. You didn't see them after that. I believe in that. Let me, let's show, let me show you. Uh, turn to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. He giveth his angels charge over thee. Do you believe the Bible? You believe what God said? Now, you'll not find the phrase guardian angel in your Bible. But what you will find is God assigning angels to watch over us and to benefit and aid us at various times in our life. Psalm 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust, and His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. And yes, I believe in a literal interpretation of verse 4, whereby you have the Holy Ghost descending from heaven in the form of a, what? A dove with wings and feathers. Now, I don't know why God chooses it to be that way, but in His infinite wisdom, He does. And so, if the Bible says that we can find cover under the feathers of God and under his wings shalt thou trust. If the Bible says we can do that, again, how do you separate what you think is the literalness of the Bible versus what you think is the uh, metaphorical... Um, the Bible is not speaking precisely the way it is. It is speaking in metaphors. It is speaking in symbols or in a symbolic way. But I remember teaching this one time in an online Bible study. And man, I got chewed out. In fact, a young man made a video against me on this one issue. And he said, everybody knows God doesn't have feathers. That's almost borderline heresy. And I'm going, I just read the Bible. All I did was quote scripture. And I'm being accused of being a heretic because I believe exactly what the Bible... There's always an explanation for it somewhere else in your Bible. And if you care to study it out, you'll find out just how true and right this Bible is. And that's really part of my thing. Is that if I'm going to trust this book, I believe that I have to trust it on exactly what it says. And if it says that he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings that's I, then I am forced to believe that scenario right there and his truth shall be thy shield and buckler thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall not come nigh thee only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he, verse 11, underline this, this verse in your Bible, and right next to it, guardian angels. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And you, you want to know what I discovered the other day um, Steven Spielberg filmmaker hates Christianity 
He hates it. And he is, ad, he is an adversary to Christianity, and I would say to Judaism, because he's a Jew. And he does not, according to just what I can see, does not believe in his people's own religion. And he often mocks Christianity. And in the movie, that he, the first movie that I ever watched from him uh, was not Jaws. It was the movie that they let him make right after the success of Jaws. He's now it's proven himself to be a fantastic director to put together a good movie because Jaws made a ton of money. And they let him go with this project called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And they let him have the budget that he wants to make it. And he begins to make it. And he wrote the script himself. And in this movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, there's a lot of different subplots to the movie. And one of the plots is that there is going to be ex an exchange between the aliens and the humans. When the aliens land at Devil's Tower, it has been prearranged with the government that they are going to leave one of theirs here on Earth and that we are going to send some humans with the aliens to go off in the mothership. Okay, now I can tell you, I, I cannot tell you that that's a true story, but I can tell you that there is a story floating around that says that Spielberg based this on an, an actual government program called Project Serpo. Now, that's not what I'm getting at. In the scene where the mothership lands and they switch over to there is a, a military chaplain. And you have these 12 people dressed in this, all in the same uniform, all carrying backpacks. And it becomes obvious to you that these 12 people are going to board the alien ship and fly away with them. That they're sitting in this chapel that has been erected on site. There's a military chaplain and the man who played the military chaplain was an actual military chaplain. And he is reading and reciting a prayer with those people, a prayer of blessing before they get on that ship and go. And guess where he's reading from? Psalm 91. And he specifically says, the Lord shall give his angels charge over thee. And I went, I know what he's saying. Because he's going to, turn they're going to turn these 12 men and women over to those aliens and let those aliens take them off and do whatever they want to with them he meant to include that in that prayer because of the nature of what those beings are they are alien entities angelic entities and those angels are now going to have charge over those 12 people and take them off planet and i'm just going that's pretty slick because it turns out that that is the exact phrase that Satan used to tempt Christ with. Remember that? Now does it make sense? In other words, jump from this pinnacle. For God has given his angels charge over thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. In other words, Jesus, jump. God will be forced to send his angels to carry you up. And Jesus said, uh-uh-uh, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, if I fell off, that's one thing. If I jump off, God's just got a mean enough spirit to say, let him fall. Let him fall. Who in here, and we don't have time to... to pronounce all these who in here believes that you've ever had a situation where God's angels were certainly watching over you and they protected you from some great calamity raise your hand look that's I, it's fine it's a truck catches the corner of his bumper and flips his car over last week and I saw the car. And he should not be here. To, he should not be sitting here tonight. Okay. Uh, I had a similar situation up in Wyoming. When I was traveling for the college that I went to. I fell asleep at the wheel. And I changed lanes. And I hit a car in front of us. And that's what woke us all up. 
And though it did damage to the car, the car was worth nothing. And these guys were miners. They worked in the mines there in Wyoming. And the cop told me, those guys make probably $25 an hour. That was 1985 money. They got paid good money. And he said, they've got this old jalopy they're driving to the mines every day. But I guarantee you, they got a brand new Ford F-150 back in their garage at home. He said, so don't feel bad about crushing their car. And that's what happened. They told it out. And I think the, the value of the car was only like $500. So that was all paid off. But anyway, clearly God used his angels to allow me to hit that car. Because had I not, I was changing lanes. I would have gone over an embankment and rolled that van probably dozens of times and killed us all. Because none of us had seatbelts on. Everybody else was asleep in the car, including me. And I was driving. <clears throat> so, yes, I do believe that God gives his angels charge over us and keeps us and protects us from certain calamities, certain sure deaths. There's no doubt in my mind that that, that takes place. And the longer you live, the more I believe that you will realize that. Uh, we've already read that. Turn to Judges chapter 6, if you would. Judges chapter 6. The appearance of angels. This one in the book of Judges. Um, this story I was. Um, this is the one I was going to get to. Uh, in the message this morning. Judges chapter 6 verse 11. There came an angel of the Lord that sat under an oak which was in Oprah. That pertained unto Joash the Abbey Ezrite and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? And now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, See, now watch this. I just said, I believe the angel of the Lord is Jesus himself in a pre-incarnate form. And now we've switched from verse 11 where it says there came the angel of the Lord. And now we just find out in verse 16, the Lord said unto him. It is the Lord. And it was the angel of the Lord that met with Moses at the burning bush. It was, he was specifically called the angel of the Lord. But when Moses addressed him, he said, Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Lord. In other words, it was Jehovah God, Jesus Christ, in that burning bush speaking to Moses. So it was. And understand, and I, here's what I believe. I don't believe that God the Father has made visitations to this earth because God the Father is holy and cannot... Be with sinners. Christ is the mediator. He is the, the intermediate between God and men so that Christ makes these appearances all throughout the Old Testament. He represents the angel of the Lord. That's what he's called. But he is also the Lord speaking. I believe it was the Lord. I believe Jesus was the one writing on the ten Writing the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, uh, verse 16. The Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. In other words, you're going to kill them all. It would be like just striking one man and all the rest of them fell. You're going to kill them all. And he said unto him, um, Verse 17, if now if I found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence. I pray thee until I uh, uh, come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And, and he said, I will tarry unto thee uh, until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah uh, um, of flour. The flesh he put in the basket and he put the broth in a pot, brought it unto him under the oak and presented it to him. And this is God here. God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. That's the same God who, watch this, does not accept our gifts 
to him as a payment for God to bless us and do what he has already promised he will do. What can you offer God? What can you pay him? What does he desire of you? Did God really tell Oral Roberts, I need $17 million? No. no. A thousand times no, that was a big scam. God, if God needed that kind of money, God can make it. Out of nothing. Our government does. Amen. Yeah. So verse 20, And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. When you pour out the broth, you've wasted the broth. You cannot put the broth back into the pot. Broth is gone. The angel of the Lord did not drink the broth. He did not pick it up and take it with him. He poured it out on the ground. Um, in verse 21, Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the sap that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And then Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. Why? I've always believed it's because the angel of the Lord, Jesus, refused to take that gift with him or to accept it. He had him pour the broth out. He touched the rest of it, turned it to ashes immediately. And now it's gone. Because God doesn't accept gifts from man. Let me ask you a question. If somebody came to this, if, if a millionaire started coming to this church. And they started unloading huge sums of money. Into our church coffers. After a while, I believe it's going to become obvious that they want to use that as leverage for me to speak what they want me to say. And I cringe at that. I have had to separate people who gave large sums of money to this ministry. I've had to separate them out and say to them, number one, don't ever call me and tell me that you give a lot of money to our church because that says something to me. It tells me that you're trying to gain leverage with me to get me to say what you want me to say, to get me to agree with you. Um, if that's going to be the case, keep your money. I'll still send you, in, I'll still send you DVDs. But do not use money to try to influence me because it w I don't it won't work. Um, and here God is showing his integrity. There's a whole thing in the Bible about gifts and offering gifts to people. And you have to always ask yourself, why am I offering a gift to somebody? Is it because I want something back from them? Always judge yourself and you won't have God judging you. But I've heard of pastors who have been compromised by people in their church because they gave large sums of money and that has caused them to shut their mouth on certain issues and not speak out against it, including one of them was the King James Bible. One, one church I know of told their pastor, if you keep preaching this stuff, we're going we're gonna to put you out. We're going to fire you. We have the, about, the power to do it. We will fire you on the spot. And you and your wife can just go find us some place else to live and some place else to go to because we're not going to have it here. And the man submitted to that. And I've I've prayed for him time from time to time ever since. But God is the one who does not accept gifts. He doesn't need them. He, he won't have them. This was the angel of the Lord. Uh, Genesis 19. Turn there. Now, again... Consider that these angels did have bodies that were tangible, touchable, that had the ability to speak, breathe, sit down, stand up, um, lay down, and definitely eat. This is now the second meal that these angels have been fed. And by the way, does, do angels eat? 
Absolutely. The book of Psalms said that God fed the Israelites with angels' food. That's what the manna was. Now, I don't, again, I don't understand that. If we have this perfected body, why do we need to eat? Well, it may not be an issue of needing to. Eating sure feels good, doesn't it? I was craving, on the way over, I was craving my gravy and biscuits. And uh, on the, I'm just going, man, I would love, I wish I would have fixed some biscuits and gravy this morning. They just taste and feel good going down. Amen. Uh, so Genesis 19, verse 1, There came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground. He said, Behold, now my lords turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. It's the same thing with... Lot, same thing with Abraham as it was with Lot. Washing their feet, offering them hospitality. And remember the verse, be careful to entertain strangers. And so both Abraham and Lot are types of this. You have two men, chapters are back to back, where they both invited, invited, invited these angels into their house to entertain them and be a blessing to them not maybe totally aware that these men were in fact angels sent by God. But he said, Behold now my lords turn in. I pray you into your servant's house. Tarry all night and wash your feet and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him, entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. Very well fed angels. So, again, the forms of the bodies that these angels partook, my question is, did they have to change anything about themselves to appear this way? And in this situation, I do not believe so. I believe that God has created a wide assortment of angelic entities. And some of them are made in the form of man. The angel who met uh, the, the disciples, Mary Magdalene, at the, uh, the tomb of Christ, he looked and appeared as a man, but in this particular case, his face shone as lightning. In other words, he had a very extremely bright countenance about him. So he had the glory of the Lord uh, literally on him. So he made them a feast and they did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, turn there for a minute because now, now we're dealing with evil, evil angels. There are several names for them in the Bible. Um, fallen is one of them. Although you'll not find the phrase fallen angel or fallen angels, you'll not find that phrase in the Bible, but we know that at least about a third of the angels of heaven are going to fall to the earth. But here we have evil angels, and that's one of the terms you will find in your Bible, evil angels. You will find uh, unclean spirits. You'll find the phrase familiar spirits. Uh, I was watching an um, interview between Las Vegas reporter George Knapp and billionaire Robert Bigelow, who has had a fascination with UFOs and the paranormal all of his life. And he said it started out with the death, let me see of a family member, I think it might have been his son that passed away. Bigelow was very grieved by this, and through the help of his wife, he hired what he referred to as a medium. Someone that he believed could get in contact with his dead son, or whoever it was, I can't remember exactly, it might have been his son, but through to somebody to get in contact with his dead son. 
And he said he hired three different mediums and all three of them were able to get in contact with what he believed was his son because these, these mediums were passing on information that only their son could have known about. Now ask yourself the question, what is the meaning of the term familiar? It means that they know you. They know who you are. They can sound like you, appear like you, but let me just wake you up to something that the Bible never says. It never says that after death you can make an appearance on this earth and talk to people. And that was a conversation I had with a, a young man not two weeks ago. He believed in, I guess he believed in spirits. He believed in haunted houses, things like that, which I do too. But he honestly believed that they were the spirits of people who had passed on, but did not find their eternal rest. And they're roaming the earth. Um, and that you will find, let me do this. I hadn't planned on it, but I'll, let me, let me do this. Have you ever seen this picture before? This picture of this little girl, the one, the one on the, on your left was taken just seconds before the picture on the right. You can clearly see that in the background, there is no one there in this, in this field. When he clicked the second picture of his daughter, he did not see anyone standing there. Yet when he developed the film, there is an image of someone in some form of white uniform facing away from the camera. But you can tell by the right, it, it's got his right arm like this, facing away from the camera. And all of a sudden now, the, he publishes this in a local paper and he's got government people coming to his house saying, we want to look at that photo. And they interviewed him and his wife and his family. He said, what, who was this? Tell us who this was. They, he said, there was nobody. I'm telling you, there was nobody there when we snapped this photograph. Uh, what is that? I don't know. But I do believe that spirits can make appearances in this world. Do not the good angels make appearances in this world. God allows the evil ones to do this as well. Uh, who's ever heard of the Amityville Horror? Remember that? Okay. Tr true, true story. The Lutz family that moved into this house, the house had gone on the market and they were trying to get rid of it. Because the previous family that lived there, the, the oldest teenage son, basically butchered and shot his entire family in that house one night in a, I would say, a demonic rage. And so the Lutz family thought, well, this is a steal. So they bought the house, moved in. Now, one thing I... I did a little research into this because the family that lives in this house right now says we've lived here for years. There's never been anything that's happened here. Never. And they say we don't discount what the Lutz family has said in the book and in the film that came out. But we've never seen anything here. Well, I did a little research and found out that the Lutz family that moved in there, they both him and her both practiced. What was big in the 70s called transcendental meditation. They meditated and got in contact with, guess what? Familiar, unclean spirits. So a lot of strange things are happening in this house. There's one room in there that's got flies all in it. George Lutz, the family owner, is freezing in this house all the time. He's wearing coats. He's throwing wood into the fire. Everybody else is burning up. He's freezing. Strange things are going on. They bring a priest in, Catholic priest, to bless the house, to get rid of whatever evil spirits. That's a joke. But he's sprinkling holy water on all the walls. And he comes out in a hurry from this certain room where all the flies are. And he says, don't let the kids play in that room. And left. 
And they try to get in touch with him. What do you mean by that? He won't talk to them. So they sent in someone who said they were a psychic investigator and they took this photograph of, let me get my pen here. You can see him right here. And the close up is right there. And let me tell you, human eyes are different than animal eyes. When you take pictures of animal eyes, they glow white and red because they have things in their eyes to help them see at night that we don't have. And that, that boy's eyes are white. Okay? And they had no idea who he was. And there's not supposed to be anybody in the house. So yeah, I do believe. I, I believe that things like this occur and I do believe that evil spirits make physical appearances in this world they've been doing it for thousands of years and this is where we're going in second samuel second samuel 28 the story is that because god will no longer speak to saul saul is forced to go to a woman that hath a familiar spirit and to me, it is now obvious, and I wrestled with this for a while. To me, it is now obvious that this is not Samuel and cannot be Samuel, would not ever be Samuel, because Samuel's a prophet of the Lord, and God has already told Saul, I will not speak to you by prophet, nor by Urim and Thummim, nor by vision. I, I'm done talking to you. I never will talk to you ever again, neither will my servants, the prophets. So he goes to a medium, a woman who hath a familiar spirit, the witch of Endor, and Finally, what happened? Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she, now Samuel's already died. And she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, what is, why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, be not afraid. For what sawest thou? This woman saw a, the physical body of a familiar spirit she said i saw gods ascending out of the earth that's another name for them gods with a little g a god or gods so you have evil angels unclean spirits familiar spirits evil spirits devils and gods okay I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he's covered with a mantle. She literally saw an old man rise up out of the ground, covered with a hood to hide his face, and Saul perceived that it was Samuel. Now, how can this familiar spirit do this? He's a familiar spirit. He is familiar with Samuel, the way he speaks, the way he talks, the way he moves about, and his appearance. And I believe that these spirits have the ability to form themselves into the images of people that at one time were in fact alive in order to deceive people. So here you have this billionaire Robert Bigelow, who's researching UFOs, researching the paranormal, he gets into it because these mediums get in contact with a dead family member of his and they have, they have for, they brought him to a place where he believes that this is real. You, more than likely, you will never be able to, to confront this man with the truth of the gospel because he'll never believe it. Because, and unless... Someone could sit him down and show him from the Bible that these spirits have the ability to masquerade as people that you know and they know secrets that they would know because they're familiar with them unless you could convince him from the Bible that this is what's happened and he's been deceived. This man is going to die in his deception believing that he spoke with a dead family member. And see, the part that, that scares me about this is that they're telling people, all of these gods are telling everybody the exact same thing. There really is no such thing as death. That there is nothing to fear with physical death. 
and that once you die, you will be fine. Everybody will be fine, will be okay. Because the universe will receive your soul. It may even use you again at some point in the future. You get to come back. They tell them whatever they, tell them whatever they want to hear. But the idea is, he says, I'm no longer afraid of death anymore. Well, only those who trust in Christ get that. This man has it under deception. Believing that after he died, and he's, he said, I'm researching two things. And they are absolutely the biggest questions on earth. There's nothing bigger than this. Number one, is there life somewhere beyond this planet? And number two, what happens to the human soul after we die? And he said, of the second, I am convinced that death is nothing to be afraid of. He's been deceived with seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's the role of these familiar spirits. They're to convince people that we can wander around the earth endlessly doing whatever we want or whatever because there's no punishment for anything we do in this life or we can come back as somebody else and make a better life for ourselves. I better stop right here. But I do have a lot more to say on this. So let's stand to our feet. Where do we find out about Job's friend? He had a ghost come by his house. And he said, yeah, the hair of his body stood on end. And he saw the physical appearance of this ghost, this spirit that made his presence known to him. And he heard what he had to say. Okay. So again, when you study your Bible, all this stuff that the History Channel and all these things are promoting, you find out there is an actual biblical basis to this. This Bible is a spirit, uh, spiritual, uh, supernatural book that shows us supernatural events. And I think we need to take them seriously because they have a, they have a purpose in them to deceive people. Okay? Um, you guys that say you've heard something around here and actually seen something, um, I don't know what to say to you other than he will not show himself to me for some reason. I've never heard nor seen anything like what's been told me. I, and I don't know why, but I just have never experienced that. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask God, first of all, Lord, you know everything. You know where every spirit is, every devil, every angel. And Father, we do ask God that you protect, you do give your angels charge over us. To protect us in our comings and our goings as we walk in the way. Certainly we understand, God, that this is a dangerous world to live in. Our lives, Father, are at stake every time we get into an automobile. Every time we travel to and forth. Every time we are in certain places, our lives could be in jeopardy. Father, we certainly realize that. And I do believe that devils try to kill and angels protect. And I do believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So that I don't have a reason to fear. So, Father, Lord, give us light and understanding. Help us to see the world that we cannot and have not seen with our eyes. And give us understanding, Lord, of things that we do see. Father, it's possible. It is possible that somebody standing in this room today will at some point in the future see something that they will not be able to comprehend or understand. And I pray, dear God, that you would open their eyes to your scriptures and show them wondrous things out of your word. Teach us, Father, about our enemies. Teach us about our friends, our allies. And that truly greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. 
Bless your word as we continue in it. Give us light and give us understanding. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen.